Hey everyone, welcome to Nga, yet again, or uh, I am pretty excited. Today I'm going to be giving my full presentation on the Pitham language. It's a really interesting language, I hope you like it. Okay, Pitham, or Pitham, a conlang by me, Agmashwa. So this logo here, this is the word Pitham written in the language um that's how it is written out in its latin orthography right there so as you can see here it is represented as the combination of the these three root consonants the aspirated p the the and the ma which is the root word that means language combined with the first sonorant cluster meaning which is if which refers to the instrumental case of a noun and the a uh, means a singular noun as in this is what you would say when you say i speak pivam i speak using the language that we use essentially this language exists within the same world as my other language autojun in a future version of North America. So those who speak Pifdam, written as Pitham in English and as Piftuka in Arojun, live in the region known as Fuvrath, which means th the country or tribe in the dative case, written as Fifgath in English and as Fitukatun in Arojun. They're an ancient people. They've lived in the region that is today Nunavut, Canada for over 12,000 years, which is represented in the area in light yellow on the map to the right. That map is meant to take place in the year 1375 after the rediscovery, which is a few hundred years before the modern version of Arojun took place. So this language was spoken long before that. So humans went extinct over two million years ago. During their last days, they infused elements of human DNA into dogs. And several years after uh, humanity destroying nuclear war, these last humans in their bunkers in the Rocky Mountains in the American Midwest released these genetically modified dogs to the world. Over a long period of time, these dogs became more and more like humans and became dog people with bipedal forms and the capability to form sounds almost the same as those of humans. Um, yeah, as I've said in my auto-tune videos many times, like, I came up with this story when I was seven years old, I didn't know what furries were back then, but, you know, I ain't a hater, so feel free to write fanfics in my conlang, go ahead, have fun with that. So the Kalman ancestor of the Pitham language was Proto-Pernth. The Uremha of the Pernth language family was around the Great Lakes region of the United States and Canada. The Pernth languages gradually spread around the majority of North America, conquering many speakers of the older Kunkla language family in the West and the fledgling Cern Cahilan language family in the Southeast. By the year 10,000 BR, before rediscovery, these Pernth speaking groups dominated the majority of North America and formed several kingdoms and developed technology to Bronze Age levels in some regions. This period lasted for nearly 900 years in the modern Futhrath region. Gradually, climate changes and other unknown factors led to the decline of this ancient world order. Population and societal decline continued until the majority of Perth-speaking communities had reverted to being isolated fiefdoms or even back to hunter-gatherer level societies. Beginning around 5000 BR, the proto cern speakers began their conquest of the continent. As you can see on the map over here, by 1400 AR, cern Cahilan languages in green covered up the vast majority of the main body of the western continent. Um, blue and light blue are the Perth speaking languages, with light blue specifically being the Pitham language by 1400 AR, and the areas in brown are remaining Kunkla languages, because they were never fully wiped out. They still exist to the modern Autojun speaking day. The Fuchlath region consolidated itself during the first millennium BR and became one of the strongest strongholds of Perth based language and culture and it really isolated itself as the main and most powerful country that spoke one of these Perth-based languages. Although the Prince language, which is spoken along the eastern coast of what is today the United States, had extreme influence from, uh, from Perth-based languages, though it is still technically 
a uh, Cernkahelan language. It's kind of like how English isn't technically a Romance language, even though it has a ton of Latin, uh, a ton of Latin and French influence to it. In the year 1 AR, the CERN civilization in eastern North America found the first recoverable preserved human technology, which quickly began to change the cultures and societies of the entire world. Fufglath resisted these changes and again managed to protect themselves from outside influences. Preserving their ancient literary roots with military force, they became known as the Poet Warriors of the North. The Pivotham language continued to develop, and this iteration of the language that I have created for this presentation was spoken between 1300 AR to around 1650 AR, several hundred years before the modern form of Autodrun took shape. So this area is the map of the Fufulath languages um, around 1400 AR. So in the lightest blue, you have the coastal Pitham dialect. In the mid blue, you have the inland and forest Pitham dialect, which is still considered the same language. There's still a very high level of mutual intelligibility. All the ones in dark blue are just other moderately related Perth family languages. Um, kind of going along a dialect continuum. Obviously, there's a lot of isolation in these areas as they're heavily forested, very cold areas with lots of isolation over. The brown, again, Kunkla, remaining languages. Green is Sarangahelan, family languages. And the gray is areas with low to no population. Okay, now on to the phonology. It's an extremely bilabial language where I have literally every of the sounds that can be bilabial on there. P, B, P, F, F. B, w, f, v, th, th, d, and l. All right, and then the included allophones, the ones that are labeled in brackets under the th, th, and d, represent sounds that can and were originally intended to be expressed as lingual labial sounds. As in, th could have originally been represented as th, as in with the tongue connecting to the upper lip with the voiced version being th, and then with the d being potentially represented as b, again, with the tongue connecting to the upper lip. And this is because long ago, they, they were notoriously bad for their hygiene in this region, and they were not expected to need their teeth to speak. There were also more, more labiolingual versions of f and v, considering that those are technically labiodental. They could have also been expressed by connecting the gums to the lower lip. It was a very toothless language for a very long time, but gradually over time, by the time the modern version of the language existed, it was extremely easy to to say the, th, the, fa, va, etc. There is a good amount of teeth involved in the language nowadays. However, this was not the case originally. There are four phonemic vowels, e, u, er, and a. Ah. However, Pitham doesn't necessarily recognize the concept of individual vowels as much as they recognize the concepts of 21 sonorant clusters that can exist between the consonant consonantal roots. And these are e, i, ear, ear, u, ow, ur, ur, um, im, ar, uim, u, if, ev, urth, uf, umf, ira, a, and eerie. The syllable structure is c, v, potential v, c, c. Now, the Pitham speaker would probably say that their syllable structure is more of an optional consonant, an optional sonorant cluster, and another optional consonant, due to their general perception of sonorant clusters as more valuable concepts than of the vowels themselves. How, of course, phonemically, it looks as it appears in this diagram. Now for the morphology, Pitham words are composed of a root of two or three consonants. Therefore, these consonant sets contain all of the lexical content of the language. The vowels and sonorant clusters between the consonants and their syllable stress determine all of the grammatical information, including the part of speech. The example here being the root ma, fa, ma, which represents the concept of east, essentially. So, with the first conjugation over to the left, we have my fam, which is the root with I for nominative and A uh, for singular, which represents either the concept of the sunrise or of the east wind itself. 
But then in this middle conjugation, we have mufim, which the u without emphasis represents past like preterite tense. Um, then you have e with emphasis on it, which represents third person singular neutral, which represents the sun rose or the day began as a verb. And then the third version to the right, we have mihumi. We have an emphasized e followed by a geminated f, which represents a high intensity of very, and then u at the end, which represents permanent, a long temporality, which is the adjectival form that also contains adverbial information that means permanently very eastern. And we have this example sentence over on the very right written at first with the Pitham orthography, which again I think is really cool, um, which says Muhim Brirui, which means the day began very cold like always, which again the second word with the roots br, br and then r represents coldness. So the romanization, the way to write it down without the fancy orthography is written very similar to the International Phonetic Alphabet with a few exceptions. The voiced labial approximate is written as a W. The stressed syllable in a word has its first vowel marked with an acute, as in the E, the A, the U, the U. Er. A weakened or whispered vowel exists at the end of some adjectives written as A with the umlaut symbol over it. However, this is not necessary as it's not really phonemic. It's almost like silent, like it's getting dropped off from the end of words. Beginnings of sentences are not capitalized, both to match IPA and to avoid confusion between ba and ba. And the names of people and some locations, if the location needs to be clarified in writing, are denoted by beginning the word with the soundless symbol of those three dots. As you could see previously in the name of the country, Fuvla. So now the orthography, which is my, probably my favorite part of this. Pifam is written using a semi-alphabetic system with one symbol per consonant and one symbol per sonorant cluster. Now it's written left to right along this diagonal axis going from bottom left to top right, where the consonants are placed above this metaphorical central line and the sonorant clusters or vowels are placed below it. And each word is written in this large connected symbol, usually drawn upwards from left to right. Um, in this diagram, we have my name transcribed into the Pitham phonology. So if my name is Robbie, it would be Rabi with the three dots in the beginning to signify that it's my name. On the left, we have the full typical cursive Pitham orthography of how it would be written. And on the right, we have a more linear structured one where I point out every aspect of the three dots you have the name we have a curve going over the first consonant to emphasize that the first syllable is getting the stress um, the first symbol represents the r sound the vowel below represents a ah. then the second consonant represents b and then after that we have the vowel e all right the dots that signify a person's name or specific location along with the line that goes over the stressed syllable can be placed with relative artistic freedom Pifam writing cannot have any font and the style of the writing is considered an integral part of the poetic nature of every individual so basically as long as you can distinguish the symbols and the emphasis and where someone's name goes in your writing you can write it however you want in whatever style you want to express your individuality in your writing. And now here's the full diagram of the orthography with every, uh, every consonant, every uh, sonorant cluster, the name, the stress, and the weak point on there, all labeled. It's, it's a very beautiful writing system and as you can see again at the bottom right of the diagram I have the word uh, pitham written out and you can see how it's structured. It's essentially an alphabet, but again, it's written in a way that's meant to flow, be one unified symbol, and to have high individuality to it. I think it's really beautiful. So the grammar of Pitham is completely synthetic. The word order is, for the most part, free. Sentences tend to place the most important concept at the beginning of the sentence. However, subject, verb, object is relatively common. The only requirement is that adjectives need to immediately follow the noun with which they are associated. So here we have a sentence. Rayma purthpa mfa yurul 
which as you can see in this several line interlinear gloss means nighttime obscures my sight of you or we have nighttime the first root being the subject then sight is the second word which is the object and then which obscure is the verb there so now getting into the conjugations this is how the noun conjugations work, how the grammatical cases work. In terms of number, we have singular, pockle, which is usually between two and four objects, and plural, representing a large sum of items. Then in the cases, we have nominative, accusative, and affectational accusative, dative, genitive, instrumental, and correlative. And the dashes in between these represent the consonants of the root. The affectational accusative is something that is specifically altered by the verb. It can just be accusative if you say, like, I go to the store. But if you say, like, I kill an animal, that's affectational accusative, because you literally change the state of being of the animal to an animal that has been killed. Now, verbs. In terms of person, we have first singular, first plural, second singular, second plural, third masculine, third feminine, third plural, and third neutral singular. Um, and then the tenses, we have present indicative, present perfect, present progressive, present subordinating, not necessarily subjunctive, but in that it activates a subordinate clause or an additional verb to be attached afterwards. We have present conditional, then we have past indicative or preterite. We have past perfective, past progressive, past subordinating, and past conditional. There is no future to represent things that you want to happen in the future, you would talk about present conditional. And then another outstanding feature of this language is adjective conjugation, where there's four levels of intensity and four levels of temporality that go into every adjectival concept. Intensity, again, goes from zero on the right, which is negative or not in any way, and then it goes to intensity one, which means something that's barely or slightly so. Intensity two, which is moderately, averagely in a way. And then intensity three is very or extremely. Then you have temporality, which relates to for how much time something exists. Temporality zero on the bottom represents something that's hypothetical or completely unknown. Um, temporality one represents something that is happening recently or immediately, something that's happening in the present right now. Um, temporality two is something that is going on for a long period of time, but not necessarily permanent. And then temporality three is something that is innate to reality or just a permanent fact of life. Um, and then again, we have the dashes that represent the consonants going in between, and the equal signs represent that it's going to be a geminated consonant. And there's an example down at the bottom, Ramvi, which comes from Ramadha, which means plant growth. So Ramvi means very well grown and green as it has been for a while, which means it's going to be intensity three and temporality two. Now, sound changes, again, not too much on the sound changes yet, I'll probably develop this more later, but for the most part, there are universal consonant cluster corrections that are over on the diagram to the right, where certain sounds that are very similar to each other or are in the same articulation but with different voicing just get blended in into geminated consonants, and basically, and most consonants followed by a la are going to get turned into a wa just because that's a lot easier to pronounce. Um, people with the coastal dialect tend to roticize their r. Instead of it being more of a r, it turns into a r, especially at the beginning of words. Then speakers further inland, instead of roticizing it, they'll tend to trill the l and bring it more back to a uvular at any point in the word. So more of a r can become more of r. And then speakers further inland tend also to remove gemination of their consonants, as in any geminated consonant kind of just becomes a singular consonant. And now pragmatics and other features. Um, negation is marked by placing the word ah before and after the clause or phrase that is being negated. Double negatives are still negative, so a negative adjective with ah after and before it will still be negative. Question marking occurs in the form of the root the 
which describes the concept of an unknown or a variable. Conjugating this root as a noun implies that the variable in question is a noun, an adjective, an adjective, a verb, a verb. A verb in a question is usually, though not necessarily, conjugated in present conditional or past conditional. So dar conjugated into any of these forms usually implies that there's something missing that you want information about, and that helps it become a question. But if it's a yes or no or a polar question, it can be expressed using a verb in the present or past conditional, uh, finishing the sentence with just the particle m. Mm. Um, then commands are also expressed using one of the conditional conjugations, though without any words or sounds that could imply a question. So it's like, you could potentially do this. Mm -hmm. There's a few copulas. The verb, well, the concept, the, the, means to be in the sense of like said in, in Spanish, gets converted into just the for something is, like, is something. Um, then we have p, p, b, which is related to the concept of eyesight. It turns into p. Then f, f, which means to be in the sense of estar, like something temporarily or uh, in a certain condition or emotion, goes to fi, which means feels. Um, then brava, which comes from the concept of something falling or being related to gravity, turns into dri, which is something that happens or occurs often. Um, and then maratha, which has to do with the concept of giving or gifts, turns into mi which means gives the impression of or acts like. And then another cool thing, the base eight number system. So it uses an octal number system, which is visualized using a clockward spiral of curves, loops, and then straight lines. So one through eight, as you can see in this image here on the, the leftmost of the spirals, goes from the values of one to eight, going around in a nice little curve. But then once you get to eight, essentially you turn it into one loop and then it goes on to this middle diagram where every following eight up to 64 gets represented by these curvy loops and then once you get past 64 then every additional 64 can be a straight line added onto it so you have the example number down here which is four combos of eight plus one two three four which equals 36 um, the largest number that you can represent in one symbol is 584 or 1110 in base 8 if we were writing it in our system. The numbers are written up in the top corner. In cardinal, we have feeb, meeb, weed, bead, thief, meeth, fich, mad. 16 would be mad, meeb, which means 8, 2, and then mad, weed for 24, which is 8, 3, and so on. Fam is 64. And to finish it all off is a small story written in the language. Just a small children's story written with the orthography and all of its beauty. Ruftirad fith mad midha pubab. Rundadir pfa. Adubawa. Ridaiwa bfu vifir thuduri. Pudam di dufwaifu daiwab. Dimado. Pudima. Dida brufmadum fu bramam. Humarf fufira umfar dufi. And that's it. That is my cursory presentation on the Pifam language. I think this language is pretty awesome. I am very proud of it. I think conceptually it's almost more interesting than Autogen, and I'm very excited to start doing work interlacing the two languages, especially as I make an evolution of this language going into the same time period as when Autogen is spoken. Because so I have some ideas for some cool grammatical shifts that are going to happen later on. So yeah, um, my girlfriend thinks that the sounds of the language being so bilabial is uncomfy, which 
you know, <laughs> I honestly think is kind of funny. So um, let me know what you think about it in the comments. Um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and whatever. Summer vacation has begun. I have graduated. I am ready to do some good old conlanging and world building contents. My autogen book should be arriving in the mail relatively soon and I can't wait to show you guys it. So um, I'm going to be making more content with Pythum, definitely. So yeah, let me know what you think and I will see you next time. Out. Mwah.